everything you learned for the last 20, 25 years, 30 years will no longer be valuable within five years and maybe within two years. No one will want you doing that task. It's not a task that's interesting to anyone. All right, Kevin, thank you for joining me today. I am happy to be here. This is going to be fun. Yeah, definitely. For anyone that might not be familiar with your work, uh, why don't you give a little background to who you are and what you do? Sure. Uh, I am a Silicon Valley technologist uh, and uh, you know CEO and CTO. I've got uh, just shy of 100 patents. And uh, I'm, I'm best known as the, the father of the virtual assistant and, uh, vo- and voice user interface. So invented uh, that technology back, back in the late 90s. In fact, it was more capable than Siri is today. But, but it went on to be the basis of Siri and Alexa and all of these things. So I've been involved in the AI space uh, uh, for, for that, uh, for, for 25 years now, uh, pushing things forward, applying it in different fields, which is great. Um, and I'm a keynote speaker, do about 40 keynotes a year, um, on, on three topics, really Silicon Valley disruptive innovation, artificial intelligence, because everybody wants, of course, everyone wants to talk about gen AI today. And then, and then an upcoming book that I'm working on called joy equals success. And that, and that came from questions about how did you ever get to do a hundred worldwide patents. What what does that mean? And I said, well, I'm joyful every every morning. I'm up. I'm joyful. Well, how did that lead to success? And so I began writing it down and say, this is why it's actually important for success. And and so we can talk about all of those today. Awesome. Yeah. Let's dive <clears throat> into the patents thing because I'm I'm interested in that because I have a friend who's extremely intelligent, but he's a person of low means and. And, uh, you know, Thomas Edison is known for having the most patents in history, I think, even to this day. And my friend and I have talked about it, and it it seems like patents are, like, cost prohibitive. So people who don't have the means can't generally patent their ideas. So how do you get to the point where you're Mm. patenting all of that? Well, Well, look, this is a great question. Technically, anyone can file a patent for a pretty low price. But but practically, you have to do a ton of research on what's been patented before and not just been patented, what's been discussed in the literature before, right? So if you say, I know, I am going to patent a brand new tar for the road, I am making it up, right? You would have to not only go research all the patents on tar and say, oh, I still have something unique. Then you have to go to every possible book and periodical and everything else and anywhere else you can find it in every other language and see did anyone else talk about your formulation, perhaps, or give any hint to it, because you can only patent unique things. And so that kind of research is very hard to do, and it takes a lot of time. And then when you're finally done with that and you say, what I have is absolutely unique, now you have to describe fully to, to a layman how to uh, execute your invention, whatever that is. I've invented a blue banana. Okay, here is how you make the blue banana. You put food coloring, you put whatever the, the thing is, right? And, um, and then you have to have unique claims. And it's the claims that are the, really the centerpiece of, of what you're doing in a patent. But those claims are, I claim a method to make a blue banana by using food coloring at this stage. I'm, I'm making, I don't think it's patentable, but you get the point. Yeah. And so you have to know, an, so, so enough about building claims and structuring claims properly. Now, look, anyone can learn this. You can go on the web, read lots of patents, read how to write your patent, how to write your own patent and write your own patent. Most of us will use an attorney, uh, that does nothing. They're patent attorneys, but file patents. They're very good at it. I just filed my 95th patent. Um, and I'm very excited about it. It's about 300 pages. We probably spent, I don't know, $75,000 on that patent. Um, it's complicated. It's, it's in the artificial intelligence space. It's an important patent. I could have done it all myself. Would have been uh, very difficult because there's so much the patent attorney brought to the process that I would not have thought of. I'm thinking, hey, this this part's patentable. He goes, no, it isn't because it's a simple mix of this, this, and this. And so anyone uh, who's educated in the state of the art would have figured this out on their own, therefore not patentable, basically. So so uh, you can do it. I think the patent filing fee is very inexpensive. It might be $200 or something like that. But but practically, the most of the patents that get issued probably had a patent attorney, probably had the right research, 
probably was structured correctly and probably cost twenty to a hundred thousand dollars or more. And and so I encourage people to do them themselves if they want, but you certainly get better patents when you do it with uh, with a professional. I'd imagine if you don't do it with a professional, you have a chance of somebody coming along and challenging it and basically making your patent nil later, right? Yeah, you always have a chance of someone coming along and challenging it, even when you've worked with an attorney. I mean, mm-hmm. what the attorney does is is try to do enough research and enough effort and enough work to make sure that um, that 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 it's unlikely that in a challenge that you'd lose. Does that make sense? Yeah. But but and and that's why you have the attorney. This is what they do for a living. Like I don't actually write patents for a living, even though I have that many. You don't write patents for a living. A, a patent attorney at any one time might have you know five to ten patents that they're working on to push out, right? And in a year, they they could do certainly dozens, maybe upwards of a hundred. And so a patent attorney, you know, they know what they're doing. I mean, this is what they do. And so, so um, you do have to pay for that expertise and it's likely a far, far better patent than, than, than you'd be able to do yourself, but it can always be challenged no, no matter what. Can we dive into your process? So when you, when you're exploring an idea, how do you know you're at the point when you're about to touch on something that is patentable, unique? That's a great question. Um, so so let's start with this. So first of all, and I think the, the, the so certainly Silicon Valley is, is challenged by this. Lots of people come up with solutions looking for a problem. And solutions looking for a problem are, you know, might be interesting to you, but it's probably not a good business because people don't have a pain point, right? So just for me, I tend to be really focused on what the pain point is that I can solve. What pain point can I solve, right? That's what I want to do. And, um, and, and, and so it starts with that, solve real pain points. Let's just start with that. That's not required for a patent, but that's a good start to build a business. Otherwise, why are you going to patent something that can never become a business? Yeah. That, that, that's uninteresting, right? So I want to start at a place where uh, for sure I am going uh, uh, to solve a real pain point and build a business out of it. Then you can say, well, if I'm going to build a real business out of this, then it's worth having an attorney and spending money and, and doing the patent correctly. And then you don't 100% know if it's patentable until you do a prior art search. And you really need to understand, has anyone ever thought of this concept before, ever? Right? That's what you need to, to get to. And that's what an attorney helps with. But you could certainly do a prior art search. There's also people out there who will do... um prior art searches uh, for you as well. And so, um, so, so, sorry, things are dinging. Stop. Uh, so, uh, uh, so you have to do a prior search, but fortunately with the web, you can do a lot of that yourself, an awful lot yourself now. So I would, um, uh, strongly encourage people who want to do a patent, uh, to, to, to do prior search. I think you're going to find more than nine times out of 10, you go, Oh, someone already described something very similar to this. This isn't patentable. Doesn't mean it wouldn't make a good business, but it might not be patentable. And it doesn't mean there, that someone who's got a patent in it. It just means that someone else described somewhere, um, you know, that this could be done. Does that make sense? So yeah. someone yeah. at some point described how to make a blue banana in, um, in a recipe book. That's no longer patentable because they described it in a recipe book. Although you could go make a business out of it because no one else has a patent on it. There are many good businesses. Many, many good businesses that, that do not require patents. Hmm. In okay. fact, you know, I, I mean, Facebook didn't become Facebook because it's patented. Yeah. In Facebook, because people started using it more and more and more and more, right? Yeah. As long as your business doesn't conflict with an existing patent, because then you could be liable for damage. You would be liable. Yes, yeah. a- absolutely. Absolutely. The patent holder has every right to sue you unless it's been 17 to 20 years and it's expired. Yeah. And that's how like generic pharmaceuticals come to market. They wait for the expiration date and the next day you got a product on the market, right? Yeah. How do that, how do they know how to make it? Well, the patent had to describe how to make it. It had to describe how to make it. That is a requirement of the U S patent system. You will describe all of your secrets on how you make this thing. And, and in doing so, since you've now taught the state of the art, we'll grant you a unique patent for 17 to 20 years. Hmm. 
but you have to describe step by step how you make this work. So, you know, uh, you get a generic drug because the patent's up on the original drug and they just fully describe how to make the darn thing. So people are ready. And on the day the patent expires, they, they're out with a product. What was the specific point, uh, pain point that you were, uh, focused on with the, the AI assistant technology? Was that voice recognition and, and deciphering what's being said or what exactly was that? Well, a pain point is um, something that a consumer or a user feels every day in their life, right? They have a problem. And so a user doesn't have a problem with voice user interface. A user has a problem at that point. This was the late 90s. Driving in a car, and they need access to information, and there sits their cell phone. Well, they can't see the information on it. It wasn't even smartphones then, so there's no screen, right? Tiny screen. But 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 they needed access to, say, their email or their calendar or driving directions or their stock price or whatever. And so we could see that in the advent of cell phones, which really came up in the 90s, that people were frustrated that when they were driving, they had absolutely no access to anything. Even if you could dial um, in some way, uh, you, you know, literally dialing on the phone, which you weren't supposed to do. Even if you could dial on the other end, there'd be no there be no service to dial that would be able to read you your email. So, so we built a service. It was called Portico and My Talk and Magic Talk, and eventually became General Motors OnStar Virtual Advisor. That would do all that for you. And she was your assistant. Her name was Mary. She would answer your phone for you. She would book people on your calendar as long as they were in your contact list. Um, she would answer your phone and say, "Oh, hi, Artie," <laughs> because she recognized your number. Incoming number. I mean, this is all brilliant, right? This is 1997, 1998. Uh, and, and, um, and again, the pain point was you're driving. Therefore, you need voice access to your data and you need to be able to talk to an assistant. So I'm going to give you Mary for $99 a month, right? How do you put all those pieces together to patent that? How, how do you actually come up with the problem solving capabilities? Well, that was a, um, you know, that was a team of over a hundred people and spending over a hundred million dollars. And, uh, I think we had 10 or 15 patents come out of that effort, uh, maybe more. Um, there were so many things we were doing that were the first time ever that we were putting things together with a voice user interface in the way we did in a very human like interaction in the way we did. And, and by doing all of that, you know, there was just no one in history who'd ever done that work before. Yeah. So that was a company based around building technology. The company was called General Magic here in Silicon Valley, public company. And uh, what we were doing was magic. Awesome. Seemingly so. But yeah. trust me, when people first talked to Mary and they'd say, well, I love you, Mary. And she'd say, well, I love you too. That's why I'm your assistant. And you'd go, oh my goodness, this is alive. Uh, of course, it wasn't alive any more than chat GPT is alive, but but uh, it did interact with you in a very, uh, very appropriate way. Very human way. Yeah, we're going to talk about AI quite a bit today, I'm sure. And I'm curious, since you've been in Silicon Valley for a long time, what are the what are your thoughts about everything you've seen change over the last few decades there? Yeah, well. Look, the driver of all change is Moore's law, which is that uh, the we'll call it speed, capability, complexity of integrated circuits of processors uh, will double every 12 to 18 months. And that law has held basically true since about 1971. And um, of course, this compiles on each other, right? So two becomes four, four becomes eight, eight becomes 16. And, and so as our processor power went up and GPU power, CPU and GPU, um, it allowed us to do more and more with AI and more and more algorithmically than we ever could before. And the algorithms we have today could have been invented 20 years ago. Many people talked about them, you know, specked out the math, but they were impossible to actually execute on anything. They were impossible to execute on any system because we didn't have the horsepower to do so, right? And so um, Moore's law has driven everything. And, and, and uh, you know, NVIDIA this week announced their 
their latest uh, exascale systems that 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 uh, are um, in, in incredibly fast. You know, they are supercomputers on their own in a little stack. And uh, and so when you've got technology like that, I can now generate video at 30 frames a second that looks exactly uh, exactly like it was shot with a camera. This is incredible. And mm. and we could have envisioned doing that 20 years ago, but there was no system in the world to run it on at all, or even 10 years ago, or even five years ago. So we are continuing to push forward our algorithms and our AI algorithms uh, at the speed that the hardware comes to market. Why isn't there a... Why does Moore's, Hall, uh, Moore's law hold out and stay true? But shouldn't there be some like hardware limitations eventually that people are running into, like yeah. actual physical yeah. property limitations? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're nearing the physical limitations in certain areas. I mean, we, we ran out of light and we went to x-ray and, and lithography. And, and, and was, so we've, we've changed over the years some. But here's what's going to happen. Eventually, the lines and spaces on an integrated circuit, essentially the, the circuitry that se- itself, will get so thin and so small that, that it'll be the width of a single electron. And if it's the width of a single electron, I, I can't get smaller than that because I have to pass electrons. Uh, so there is a physical limit, and we will, we will hit that physical limit perhaps over the next decade or, or, or so. But because of that, we've been working on other kinds of uh, transmission vehicles for integrated circuits, including light, full light wave circuits that actually literally move photons, not electrons. Mm. And so a photon moving isn't, uh, is a really different thing, right? And, um, and it's not subject to the same physical limitations as an electron running on copper. Um, so, so there's photonics, uh, that, uh, has an opportunity to be our future. There's also DNA circuitry, literally that's DNA and working that way. So people are working on other things that go beyond moving an electron on copper lines, right? Yeah. Uh, but I, th- I think we're good for another decade. And then at some point, um, you know, not so good. So if you're moving photons, then you're able to transmit information at the speed of light three times 10 to the eighth meter. <clears throat> that's okay. right okay yes th- yeah that's right and 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 so uh, photonic circuits already exist today but they don't exist at the uh anywhere near the capabilities that we have electronic circuits uh and that's because we've got a lot of history of electronic circuits and getting really really good at them what are you most excited for as the technology improves like what are are, are there capabilities that you don't see available right now that you see on the horizon? Well, I think that um, what we're going to be able to do. So, so what we did with with math with Excel was amazing, and then and then we had a language model, large language model, starting in 2017. Most people are, are if I say ChatGPT, they'll know it as that. Yeah. That's a large language model, and that is certainly impressive to manipulate language and sentences in that way. Uh, and we could talk about how it actually works. It's not sentient at all. It actually doesn't know what it's doing, but it's really good at putting sentences together. And then, um, and then visual models, um, stable diffusion, mid journey, Dolly three are really coming along. And just two years ago, what we were generating was not very good. And what we see today is, as good as a camera would take, right? I mean, it's yeah. as good of a, it's photography basically, but without any photographer and no photograph being taken. That's amazing. And now we're taking those kinds of things and saying, well, let's move them, you know, for three seconds and five seconds. And, and so you get the beginning of a movie and then we've said, let's do 30 seconds. And now we've got, you know, a scene of a movie or, you know, certainly at two and three minutes. And so now we're looking at scenes being generated fully with no camera people, no one feeding a crew, no actors. It's all generated fully by, by artificial intelligence and GPUs that are able to work at that speed. This is the most exciting time in history. So, you know, we're going to see the way we create film. And this is, you know, if I'm looking forward, right, we've got LLMs. Everybody, everybody's played with them. 
I use it every day as a tool. Uh, we've got image generators, illustration generators. I'm using them every single day. They're just a part of my kit. And then we're going to have video generators. And the video generation capability is unbelievable. Uh, I actually, I, if, if we want, I can technically share something and show you some, show you some examples today. Uh, it's yeah. unbelievable. And so, so when you think, when you, when you ask the question that way and say, what's, what's going to be mind blowing sort of in the future, I think when everyone can make their own movie, even yeah. a two hour movie for a hundred dollars, you know, that doesn't say it'll be a good movie. It just says it'll, it'll look like it was made in Hollywood. It could be a terrible script, right? But, it, but it could, it'll look like it made in Hollywood without a sound stage and without a movie studio and without a director and with no camera people. I don't know what that does to the industry. But it's, it, it is, it is transformational and it's super exciting because now everyone will be a content creator. Let me add one more thing. Just like you today can have a podcast for, I don't know, call it a hundred or two hundred dollars for a little bit of equipment or five hundred dollars, right? But if this was 20 years ago, you probably to have two hours, you might have needed to own a radio station yeah. and, and an antenna at 50,000 watts. And so, you know, the entry fee was several million dollars and today it's a couple hundred bucks. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, I'm blown away by technology all the time. I have music production software that basically puts what would have been a multi-million dollar studio on my computer for a thousand dollars. So it's, it's pretty remarkable what unbelievable. we have. Yeah. Un unbelievable. Exactly. Technology is changing pretty rapidly. Uh, why don't we go back a little bit because a lot of people have really only started to hear about AI in recent years, but it's not new AI as a concept. I think it started in the 80s or was it soon? Uh, in the 50s. In the 50s. Okay. Yes. Those 50s, the yep. 1950s, even a little bit of work in the 40s. Um, and, and by the 60s, we, we even had human like interaction with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, some, 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 some work out of MIT called ELISA. And so we were already testing these kinds of machine learning and artificial intelligent things, artificial, uh, uh, you know, agents almost. So lots and lots of work. And, 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 and in between, you'd make these big jumps and then be nuclear winner and then big jumps and then be AI nuclear winner again. Yeah. And Gen AI is one of those big jumps. I don't know that there's a, a, another winter, but, but, but most of these technologies, um, um, excite and then a little bit disappoint because people, people see it for the first time and they go, it'll do everything. And then after using it for a while, they go, it does some things really, really well. I'm going to use it for that, but it's really disappointing on these other things. And it's every technology, every technology, right? From the automobile. It's just, oh, it's really good, but it's kind of disappointing over here. Well, so you go through that trough of disillusionment and then you come out the other side and you go, this is very valuable. And, 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 and so we're, you know, somewhere in Gen AI, depending on who you are, uh, anywhere from holy cow, this is amazing to I'm pretty disillusioned by it because it gave me some wrong answers. Right. But once you understand what, 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 what content generation can be with say GPT four, chat GPT, Gemini, whatever, uh, it's a game changer for your life. For certain aspects of your life, not for everything. Yeah, I use uh, ChatGPT and other LLMs frequently, and generative AI, Midjourney, Dolly, all of that stuff. But there are definitely limitations of what it can do. Um, at, at least at the consumer level, using ChatGPT, for instance, uh, there's not a great data storage system when it comes to. Chat GPT, uh, uh, GPTs that you built and stuff like that. So uh, right. I'm right, finding right. limitations all the time. There, there's a bunch of limitations, but on the other hand, if you ignore the limitations and you know what it's good for, yeah. it's amazing. So obviously already, because you're on Riverside, um, what you can do today versus five or six or seven years ago, um, this podcast will be transcribed into text. That text will be fed to an LLM and it will summarize this entire talk. And yeah. so a talk that was two hours now gets summarized down and, and it'll happen in, you know, a matter of minutes. Um, you would have had to do that work five years ago manually by re-listening to the podcast and trying to take some notes and, and then come up with a short summary of five, 10 sentences. I don't know. You don't have to do that work anymore. Yeah. Actually, nobody ever wanted to do that work. So, 
So it's fascinating, right? This is a fabulous technology for that. That is an LLM. And, um, uh, and, and so if you know where to use it, if you're, if you are in marketing and you've got to write a blog post, trust me, you know, give the right set of prompts to, to uh, GPT-4 and you will get a beautiful blog post and you can redo that blog post a few times in a matter of minutes, you're done. And you might make a few edits and post it chop, chop instead of spending the entire day. Yeah. There's a, there's an article that Spotify put out and they go over writing a good description that's valuable and, and, and can help your podcast. I actually created a GPT, fed that data into the GPT. Yeah. And then I use that for creating all my descriptions because right. why not, right. why not go off the information that Spotify puts out? That's right. Just use those rules, tell the LLM to use those rules and it will. And there you go. And there's your, I'll, I'll have to go look up your GPT and use it myself. Yeah. Did you publish it? Is it in the GPT store? Uh, I have to see if it's, you know, I, I think I can put stuff on the GPT store now, but before I was having a problem verifying my website, getting it to connect to my website, like verifying right. the the code, right. it kept it keeps saying it's an invalid code <laughs> in there, even though it's the only code in there. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I'm not that literate with it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all fun. And, and like I said, I think people should make these tools a part of their life, just like we make Excel. I mean, it, it, when's the last time you did long division with a pencil or even in your head? It's been a while, yeah. you know, a Since decade or two grade. or something. Yeah. And, and you don't need to do that because we have calculators and Excel today. And, and so, you know, we have math models and they work great and we use them every day. And so it shouldn't be a surprise that a language model is something we're also going to use every day. It's just part of our daily work um, to, to get suggestions, to get recommendations, to create content that's what we're going to do. And it, and, and that's good. It's good for all of us. Yeah. People want to use these tools to generate art and do all sorts of things. Um, when it comes to video creation and stuff like that, I know Sora is about to be released to the public here anytime. Um, probably sure. in the fall. I'm not okay. sure it'll be too soon, but okay. it's, a, it's a very expensive model to run. Very yeah. expensive. So it won't be free. Yeah, so people that are using other video generation technologies right now, like starting from a, a picture and then creating from that, and there's ones that can do like five second bits. Mm -hmm. um, are they wasting their time right now, or are they being valuable with their time learning how to prompt? Like, is the technology going to be so far advanced a year from now? that the time that they spent using these current models are going to be just outdated and useless? Well, look, um, everything we're doing today will be um, obsolete a year from now in this space, right? Because we're at the very beginnings of this space. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't learn to do what you can now with the tools that are available, right? I mean, I use MidJourney. I use Stable Diffusion. I use Dolly 3. They're all great. Some are better at certain things than others. And I, and I use versions that take you know, take my own face and make things of them as well. And, and so I have found that all valuable, certainly for my keynote talks. Um, there's so much in illustration that I want to do that now I can have AI do for me. Uh, and I'm not a great illustrator, but it is. And so as long as I can describe it, I will get the illustration that I want, I including, you know, generate a photographic, realistic photographic view of a chicken nugget plant. And it'll draw it in 30 seconds. I couldn't draw a chicken nugget plant this, you know, to save myself. <laughs> and it can draw one in 30 seconds. I don't know if it's accurate or not, but close enough for, you know, for, for a presentation. So this is really incredibly powerful stuff, right? Yeah. And, and, um, so I'm using it every day. I use it for all of my keynotes and I, and I note that, you know, these were generated by uh, some type of Gen AI model and, and how I generated it. And so, because you want to teach people. So use what there is today. Learn what there is today. Use what there is today. And, uh, and then when there's new things tomorrow, you'll, you'll learn those tools as well. Can you share what you're using to have images created based on your image? Yeah, that's a, uh, it's a, that's a model called Vanta. I Vanta. Think it's, uh, hang on. I'm going to. Hang on, I'll give it to you very accurately. I might be slightly off, but just give me a second. I believe that's correct. Vanna or Vanta. And um, 
And it, it is great because I can say, put me in a Vanna, V-A-N-A. I, I put me in a, a spacesuit. And I upload some pictures of me and boom, there's me in a spacesuit or me somewhere else, right? In different angles and different looks and different feels, that's actually very valuable. And, 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 and there's models using this, which is fascinating because they can't make it to that photo shoot, but I'll charge you half and you could put me in, uh, in those outfits in, you know, out uh, in Paris, but I can't make it to Paris and boom, there it is, right? So you can do some interesting things now without ever going to space and without ever owning a spacesuit, I'm in a spacesuit. Now, yes, I know Photoshop. I could have done all that in Photoshop. I could have taken, I don't know, three hours to make six photographs like that, but I, I didn't, I took 30 seconds. Yeah. And I mean, there are things that the AI can do that weren't possible as far as I know. Like uh, I use, I'm blanking on the name of it, but it's a, it's a program to, oh, Topaz, Topaz Labs AI. Oh, so Topaz it, Labs. Yeah, the the uh, the AI they're using to improve uh, resolution, basically. Yeah, and that's something that couldn't be done ten years ago, as far as that, I'm aware. That, that's right. Um, they're they're doing both still frame and video. Um, it's 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 good. It's not astounding yet, but yeah. it's the best model out there. And these models are going to get better, and their models are going to get better. I I think there is a time that we will. Um, take an SD video, you know, if everyone knows what that is, but old style, you know, standard definition and upscale it to 4k. And, um, I think the models that I see being worked on are not going to just try to fill in the pixels. It's going to use what it sees almost as the starter of a diffusion model and literally rebuild it from scratch. If that makes sense. Right. Yeah. So just the way we're, we're creating 4k imagery, um, in Sora, when you see the Sora examples, um, if I had an old SD image as a starting point, I should just use that as the as the as the seed to a diffusion model, and then come out with ultimately um, any resolution I want because I'm now generating the pixels. So I'm not going to use the pixels that are there. What Topaz does is try to fill in. You know, if I've got four times more pixels, then what would have been here, right? Yeah. You can use a bunch of algorithms to guess what would have been there. And if it's a person, you've got people models and you can fill that in. For I think that whole concept goes away when you say, I'm going to use this to see the diffusion model and I'm going to build the pixels. So, so when you see a photograph, uh, and maybe I've taken an old photograph, or I took an old video or whatever, it was low definition, um, you're not going to be seeing any more the actual pixels that were actually shot through the camera. You're going to see a representation of those pixels that AI interpreted and re-rendered. And that's pretty interesting because it's an exact representation, but it's as if um, it's as if I was there now with a 4 or 8K or 12K camera. Yeah, and, and it definitely has limitations. If it's too low in resolution, then it, it adds things that are just, it'll distort. Not old right, pictures. I see that, yeah. 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 I've used and, it quite a bit. And then mid journey, if you upscale a picture, an image from mid journey, it's better if you had originally upscaled in mid journey. Because Absolutely. It, it just can't recreate that. No, detail. That, that's right. No, I, I always, you know, all, all mid journey stable diffusion Dolly, I'm always asking for, uh, you know, something in a, in a high resolution, essentially 16 by nine. Yeah. And, um, and I'll typically give it the number of pixels and try to, try to force it to give me what I want. Um, because if you get some small, nothing much better than a thumbnail, it's very hard to upscale that separately. Yeah. What do you recommend for people to get into artificial intelligence and get familiar with the technology if they're, if they're maybe tepid about getting in there and they haven't explored it too much and they really are curious, but they just don't know where to start? Well, look, the thing is, is chat GPT, not GPT-4, but chat GPT is free. Gemini is free uh, to some extent, and so is Copilot. Uh, it's not exactly free, but uh, widely available in, 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 in Word and Excel and PowerPoint and such. And, and these are so accessible because you can essentially speak to them in English and it'll speak back. And that is valuable. And, and, and you know, so if you've installed Copilot for Word, it changes the way you use Word because you get to write something. You go, well, 
Copilot, why don't you write this for me? And, and then I'll just edit it, right? And you go, do, 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 do. And you go, oh, that's pretty good. Or you say, rewrite it or whatever. And it's built into Word. This is valuable, right? This is valuable. And it'll even format it in ways that I wouldn't have thought to format it. Uh, so I, I, I think that what you want to do is simply get used and comfortable, get used to and get comfort in the tools that are available today. And 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 uh, learn them and enjoy them and again, you know, ChatGPT is free for everyone. So just go use it a little bit uh, and learn for yourself. You know what what works and what doesn't work. Um, prompting has gotten a lot easier over the last year. Um, the models are smarter. So I, I I think you know there's what I would say with prompting is the more you give it, the better the output's going to be. I mean, people yeah. think I'm going to give it a prompt and they can I get it down to eight words? No, no, no. no. Put 80 words in, put 800 words in. The more you put in, the better, right? In fact, write something fully and say, here is a 200-page overview of X. Please rewrite it for me. And it'll do a great job on that because you gave it your 200 words. Yeah. You know, and it has a lot of data there. So the more you give these models, the better The better it is. Yeah, one of the ways I like to use it is if, if I'm talking to somebody and presenting an idea, rebutting an idea, I... I'll write it myself, but then I'll often feed that into ChatGPT or Grok or whatever I'm using at the time and say, does my argument make sense? Does what I'm saying make sense? Are there any flaws in my argument? Right. Stuff I love like it. That. It's yeah. like having a little assistant next to you that's not always right, but will always have advice. Yeah. Yeah. Unless you ask it how to build a nuclear weapon. No advice given. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, speaking of nuclear weapons, some a lot of people are worried about AI, and I think some of it is uh, more reasonable than others. I'm not, you know, the Terminator future that some people worry about isn't something that I'm particularly worried about, but I'm more worried about uh, disinformation, uh, election interference, things like that, that could easily happen with AI as, as it becomes more capable. You know, people can create an image of uh, politicians in compromising situations using a like stable diffusion or something like that. Eventually, I don't think it's quite there. I think you can usually see where that something isn't right in a lot of AI generated images that try to be photorealistic. But are are there any areas of AI that you are concerned sure. concerned with? Well, first of all, let's start with this. You know, don't hook chat GPT to the nuclear arsenal. This is a bad idea, right? So we're not going to do that. It's air gapped. Don't, don't worry about it. To, you know, today LLMs and these, and these vision generators are all just running in systems at Azure or AWS or Google. So they're just sitting in the cloud. You can unplug them. They, they're not hooked to anything. They don't actually manifest anything in the physical world. They can't actually do anything. So everybody's got to just calm down about that. The second thing is, is, um, you know, like all technologies, including the automobile, you can do bad things with them, right? I can make a car bomb out of a car. It's a perfectly good vehicle until I fill it with explosives and run into a building. Then it's, then it's bad, right? Yeah. And, and, and we're not scared of cars, but we recognize that people can take any form of transportation and turn it into a bomb. And that's a really bad thing. But, um, but we try to put in the right safeguards uh, as much as we can. And this is true with all technologies. And it's certainly true with AI is that people, some people already bad actors are using open source models in really nefarious ways. I am, I, I want to cover the images first because you brought that up. So the fact of the matter is anyone with a little bit of training, maybe a thousand hours, if not 10,000 hours, uh, uh, could have put manipulated images out there. Uh, for the last 25 years with Photoshop, 30 years, right? So, so much so that we got so used to it that we said, oh, that's Photoshopped. It literally became a verb, right? Yeah. It's Photoshopped. And I know Photoshop, and if I wanted to put any U.S. president in a compromising position, I, it might take me a few hours, but I could do a really bang-up job at it, right? That's true for, that's been true for decades. So, so people already know that. Like, it's not that, Americans don't know that there are fake photos out there. They've seen fake photos for decades. And, and the person comes out and says, that's Photoshop. That's clearly not me. 
And while I haven't tried, I am sure people could go to some site and find, you know, some of our U.S. presidents there naked. <laughs> so I don't ever want to see that, but someone could, right? And, and, and clearly they're Photoshopped. And it might be just their head on someone else's body, but whatever the case is, right? Um, so, so we've had that for a long time. So what's different now? Well, people are going to say, well, how about deep fakes? Cause they're video and they're really going to be different. Well, hang on. You know, Hollywood's brought people back from the dead for 30 years. We've had CGI. We've, we've seen, you know, the, the final, uh, you know, final movie of Star Wars clearly had Princess Leia who had passed away before you ever got to film any of that work, right? So, so the fact of the matter is, is we've trusted Hollywood with putting people in places that they never were before. What we're worried about is now people who have, you know, 12 cents to themselves can do the same thing. Yeah. And uh, my prognosis is that we will begin to get used to the fact that video is easy to fake, just like, and by the way, video has been relatively easy to fake. I'm a Final Cut Pro person, so I really could probably take anyone between Photoshop and Final Cut Pro and put them in a video and have them doing things that they never did and could have done so certainly for the last decade or two. It's not worth my time to do it. It would take, I'd have to spend a day on it to make it look good. I don't want to spend a day doing that. That's uninteresting. But, but the fact of the matter, there are fake videos. People have been faking videos. And now it's just going to get really easy to do, right? Really, really easy to do. And that easiness to do is what, uh, is what should scare people. Um, so there's going to be lots of deep fakes. And we're going to start to not trust the videos. And that'll be that. Just like we don't always trust photos. We don't trust photos. So yeah. it's fine. Uh, here's the one caveat. Is what people are doing right now with these LLMs is they're generating with the open source models, they're generating uh, phishing emails that are indistinguishable from real emails. They're very, very good. And so cybersecurity has an issue here because uh, cybersecurity never had to fight AI models uh, for getting people's attention, and, and now they do. And so that, that is a change. And, uh, you know, we've all been trained on how to deal with phishing emails, but your training isn't going to help you when they're that good. And, when, and then when you call the number and it sounds like, your boss on the other end that's yeah. now uh you know a voice clone i can clone my voice in under a minute you probably cloned yours those of us in this field easily clone voices I, I, and it's valuable so so i i cloned my voice and had it read a book and it did and it's me reading the book except i never read the book yeah and i don't have to read the book anymore and still you could buy that audiobook of me you can't because i didn't publish it but if i wanted to You'd buy that audiobook of me reading the book to you, even though I never had to read it. I never went to the studio anymore. I cloned my voice for one minute. It read the book. Brilliant. Brilliant. I never wanted to sit there and read a book in a studio for six days, which is yeah. what sometimes it takes, right? So, um, so, you know, now we can clone voices and that means we can clone president's voices and other, you know, election voices. And, and you're going to say, I, I can't believe they said that, except most people within the year will say, I don't need to believe they said that there's because it's just a voice clone and everyone will know that there are voice clones. And by the way, we've no, we could do voice clones. You know, Hollywood's done voice clones for a long time. I've known how to do voice clones before this AI technique has come along, right? As long as I had enough vocal information, I could put it back together in, in, an, in any audio program. So we've, we've made people say things they never said for a long time. And now it's just getting easy. For cybersecurity, are we getting to the point where you're going to need AI to fight against the AI? So you're just going to have, it's going to be this continuous battle of, I need to keep upgrading my AI to combat the AI phishing attacks and cyber attacks. Um, the, 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 the answer is certainly, uh, to some extent, yes, right? There's, there, there's no question that we not only need AI to combat the AI, but we need, you know, people to be aware that AI is generating these things and people to not do dumb things, right? So, so I'll give you an example. You know what MFA is in 2FA, yeah. uh, two factor authentication. MFA. So for the last few years, people get a code on their phone or they go to an authentication app for something and they go, wow, I'm really secure. Okay. Every major ransomware attack over the last year included a hack of the MFA. Every single one. Hmm. So your MFA 
adds a little layer of protection, but it's basically zero. Now, there's social engineering hacks to those, and then there's actual, you know, actual technical hacks to them. I won't describe how they're all done. They're done quite easily, is what I would tell you. And that uh, actually, if you're a ransomware hacker, you don't even need to know how to do that. You go to an IAB, that's an uh, initial access broker, and they will get you initial access and, and tell you, I now have access. I'm turning over the account to you. You don't even know how they did it. But, um, but I'll give you one super easy trick because it's been published out there, which is you have these authenticator apps, the Microsoft Authenticator app, which, uh, you know, um, it tells you to authenticate every time you log in to say Outlook or something, right? But also, um, when you bring up Outlook on your laptop and it goes out to the server, it might also say, please reauthenticate. So lots of reasons to authenticate. All a hacker has to do is at 1 a.m. in the morning, 2 a.m. in the morning, start um, trying to log into, let's say there's 10,000 people in a company, try to log into thousands of their accounts, and it starts pinging the authenticator app, which on your phone goes ding or buzzes or something, right? Would you believe upwards of 10% of the people will finally reach over and click the authenticator app and say, yes, that's me, figuring that it's just their laptop trying to log in yeah. For some reason, lost connectivity, came back, trying to log in. Yes, it's always been me. It's still me. So these kind of social engineering hacks like that, and there's much more complex ones, are incredibly easy to do with AI because I can go scour the, the, the dark web. I can find all these logon IDs and passwords. I can find that they're at the same company. I can then push this out to do all of this, uh, um, you know, pinging all at 1.30 in the morning. I 10% of the people let me into their account, and I'm in. I only needed one to cause a ransomware attack, but I'm in. This is fascinating. And it works every time as long as you're doing it en masse. So if I just did it to Artie, I might not get you to fall over for it. But if I'm doing it to 100 people, somewhere between 1 and 10 are going to give me access. Every time. Guaranteed. And they know that. Yeah. So your MFA doesn't make anything secure. And there are technical hacks where I can reroute your phone quite easily. Only for a moment to grab the code that's coming to your phone. And people are going to listen to this and go, that's impossible. No, it's quite possible. It's quite easy, actually. But if I told everyone how to do it, then they'd go out and do it. Maybe ask AI. Maybe it'll tell you. So, so these things are pretty easy, right? So, so, uh, so one of the companies I'm working uh, uh, with is called uh, Token. And Token makes a ring that goes on your finger and it's tied to your fingerprint. There is no code on it. There's no buzzing. There's nothing. You either have the ring on your finger to access your application right at your computer, or you don't, and no one can access it, and that's it. No access to the network, no access to your applications. It's hack-proof. It's really unhackable. Uh, and, and there's no social hack, because you can't get someone to give you some code because there's no codes. There's nothing. There's no readout on it. So that's, that's called next-generation MFA. So legacy MFA is 20 years old. It's, you know, AI is killing it. And next generation, probably, uh, uh, I think, undefeatable for now. Interesting. Um, what steps do you recommend people take in the meantime as next gen MFA is coming out and not everything is upgraded to that level? Like, what steps do you recommend people take right. at this point? So, so the good news is all commercial applications, enterprise applications today will accept next generation MFA. Uh, it's called token ring. And so it'll accept the, the token ring, all of them. Uh, it's the FIDO2 protocol. So it's an industry agreed on protocol for next generation and it accepts it. It's a biometric protocol. Um, most consumer stuff doesn't cause it's consumer. And like, does anyone really care if, I guess it's terrible if they gain access to your Facebook, but nobody's going to die. Right. Yeah. But in an enterprise situation, I mean, people can die. It's a hospital, it's an insurance company, whatever. So. Um, look, I, I mean, for now, use MFA and use very, very, very long passwords, like ridiculously long, because those are unguessable. And, you know, it, in a brute force attack and, you know, an eight character password, you know, will, uh, you know, will be cracked in a matter of minutes, period, in a matter of minutes. So th that doesn't work, right? So you've really got to come up with things that are really long. And, and I know people said, uh, come up with, you know, originally... Use passwords that have all these letters and numbers and this, it actually kind of doesn't matter. 
because in a brute force attack, they're going to do all those combinations anyway. What you want is a really long phrase that's like, you know, 20 characters long, right? That's pretty, that's un, unhackable. It's, yeah. it's unhackable. But they may still steal it and they may still get access that way. So you want, you want that and you want, um, you know, whatever MFA you've got. And then you never, ever, ever give your MFA codes to anyone. I don't care if your bank calls you and says, look, you know, we're in your account. We think there's someone in here. Um, let's go ahead and log in and um, you're going to get code on your phone for me to get in with you. I'll need that code this one time. And you trust that person. They sound like they're from whatever bank you're banking with. And you give them 4372. And they go, okay, I'm in with you. Everything's good. You don't have a hacker. Uh, nobody would draw any money. You're protected. You leave, they withdraw all the money. Yeah. Very easy to do on, I'm going to say older people, and I don't mean to you know, put anyone in a bucket, but they tend to target older people who are less likely to, um, to be concerned and more likely to trust that it was the bank. Yeah, I mean, you, you hit on a, an important point. Like humans are generally the biggest weakness in cybersecurity. It's, it's people. Yeah. So, yeah, with that, I, I actually have a question from, uh, sometimes you go on a website or application or something like that, and it's saying, create a password, and it'll actually give you a restriction about how long the password can be. Is there any benefit to the site, to the actual development of a site to restrict password length? No, it's when they coded it, that's how long they made that string length. It was 14 and that was it. That, mm -hmm. that, that, it serves no purpose to do that. It, it, it should be unlimited, but if you had to put a limit, you know, it'd be nice if it were like, you know, 255 characters or something, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, rather than say 14 or 16 or something like that. But, but, you know, pick a number that's long, 25, 30, 40. And then um, that is, the, you know, that is the, that is the best thing you can do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we have deep fakes coming out more accessible and you touched on it. It's the accessibility part, just being generally accessible. That makes it more difficult. Are we heading for a future where where people just don't know what's real and what's not? Well, we already have a situation where people don't know what's real or not, but they believe things anyway. Um, you know, the web is full of disinformation. It's been full of disinformation for a long time. Even when it's posted from sources that you may feel are legitimate, those sources may be um, compromised and those sources may also, in order to sell ads, be interested in putting, you know, crazy headlines out there. Right. Yeah. So I'd say, um, I'd say that people are aware of disinformation, certainly aware of it in the last election, but have been aware of it for a long time, whether we are critical thinkers enough to stop and think, you know, look at how many people uh, still believe the earth is flat and they'll fight you to the death. And maybe you do. And I don't mean it in a, <laughs> in any knock. Right. But, but, I'm sorry, there's, there's just way too much evidence for the last, let me think, 3,000 years, you know, or whatever, the hundreds of years, that the earth is round. It just is. It's a ball. It's round. That's it. Everybody get over it. And there's no reason to argue this. The, the data are what they are. And yet people will fight you to the death. And, uh, and look, uh, you know, I mean, there's other, I mean, lots of disinformation around vaccines and, uh, again, not trying to. Uh, take a political side on it. It's just there's lots of disinformation, uh, on, you know, probably on both sides. So, so I think disinformation uh, has been out there. The problem is we've lost our critical thinking ability in some circles to stop and say, does this make sense? Right? Is this, you know, the Earth being flat? Is is you know? Let me critically think about what's being said. Let me let me go to the literature. Let me see what scientists have said. Let me see how you prove, you know, it's round. And you have all these proofs that it's round. All of them, including planes that keep flying all the way around. I mean, there's no way it would work, right? They'd, they'd go off the edge and it can't work. No. So, so um, and, and in fact, you can see the curvature of the earth, you know, from tall buildings and planes. Um, so all you have to do is critically think. And somehow people stop critically thinking. They just stop and go, no, I believe these sources and therefore it's the following. You know, I believe Trump this or I believe Biden that. D did you critically think about that? Did you double check? 
you know, where the sources came from? And did you double check that that was delivered to you, you know, without a opinion? And so I, I, you know, I would say there's great value in teaching critical thinking skills and at university so that people don't come out losing their ability to think critically about everything they see. Yeah, I'm, I'm somebody that actually encourages, or I, I think it's healthy to explore certain conspiracy theories um, because some conspiracies end up being true, but it, it is interesting that people grasp on to and will not let go of things that are provably false, like the earth being flat. You'll see somebody rejecting all science. They they won't do the simple experiments that you can do on your own to prove that the, the earth is round. Right. But right. then they'll trust somebody on Instagram or or YouTube with a cardboard box and a flashlight doing some little experiment. Hokey and, thing, yes. Yeah, that person's trustworthy for some reason, and it it, yeah. it, 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 it does, it's it's nonsensical, and um and maybe maybe it's a result of the U.S. education system that went downhill. I don't know. I mean, how yeah. how could we be at a point where someone thinks the Earth is flat? So obviously, there's other things that. You know, there's conspiracy theories around the, 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 to this day, the JFK shooting, obviously. And, and since, um, you know, we don't know the whole truth there and there's still redacted documents, you know, that's certainly up for debate, right? Was yeah. there another shooter? Was there another bullet who was behind it? I get that, right? And so at least we can, we can discuss those things, right? We can have a, a, a reasonable discussion. There's no reasonable discussion on the earth being round or flat. Yeah. That's, it's, it's unreasonable. And I, and, and, and so, um, you know, there's an old adage that if someone absolutely believes something that isn't true, you're not going to change their mind. Actually, they're they're That's done. Right. You can't you can't uh, negotiate yourself out of that because they already were willing to believe something that has no basis in fact and cannot be proven. They're already there. So so they're willing to believe that you're not you're not going to change their mind on the facts. Yeah. They rejected the facts. It's over. So, so we do have this problem in the country and in the world, uh, and that just gets back to, again to critical thinking. It gets back to education, and uh, and the fact actually that people who think the Earth is 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 flat also believe themselves to be incredibly smart, so smart that they believe the Earth is flat and we can't see it, which is another problem. So it's this self fulfilling prophecy of I'm so smart, and and you're the one who doesn't understand. You can't po so you can't possibly convince me because you must be dumb thinking the earth is round. This is really fascinating, right? So so now AI is going to generate more and more of this junk. And um and the only way out is critical thinking. I mean, you you know, you can't fact check everything, but you have to have critical thinking about it. You know. So uh you know, do we do do we uh really believe that Biden went rock climbing today? Mm, critical thinking says no, he didn't go rock climbing today. Whatever side said that, probably not, right? He's, I don't know, 81 years old, probably not rock climbing. Just don't do it. And they wouldn't let the president rock climb anyway, no matter what president it was, right? Yeah. So, so, I mean, we have to, again, we have to just critically think about what we hear. Yeah, it was base jumping, actually. But. Yeah, right. <laughs> it was base jumping. No, you, yeah, you get, you, you get my point. And, and, and the same would be true with, you know, Trump. Trump went rock climbing or base jumping. Probably not. I, yeah. I just... But, but I can, but what I heard he did, no. Well, then I, I got a news report, no. I, and I saw a picture, I still don't believe it. Now I saw a video of him base jumping. Don't believe it, I'm sorry. Yeah. Not, no, not gonna happen. I mean, just be realistic, right? And this is not a knock against either of those gentlemen. It just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, so please yeah. use critical thinking skills and you will find that you might be smarter than you think. And, 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 and don't get sucked into these, you know, sort of crazy harebrained ideas. Yeah. Um, you've predicted in the past that by 2050, uh, work will be, uh, remind me, it's, it's not going to be non-existent, but work was. Yeah, gonna it's going to be very different. Like, like 90, 80, 90% of the tasks that we do today will be automated by AI in some way. There will be tasks to do. We will be the robot overlords. Uh, we will be in charge. Um, but uh, it might be a three-day work week, not a five-day work week. The productivity levels are going to be ridiculously high because we're going to be managing AI and robots and things like that. So what if somebody is skeptical of that because productivity has 
increased dramatically over the years, but people are still asked to work 40 hour work weeks, which was put in place during the industrial revolution. Yeah. Well, uh, it's a funny thing. I'll, I'll answer for the United States because in the U S well, productivity has gone up and the GDP has gone up and, uh, uh, you know, our per capita income has gone up and all of that is followed. Our current level of unemployment is at an all time low. Now, why is that? And that's because these companies need even more people to grow at the rate they're growing. So, in fact, if everyone worked 50 or 60 hours a week, we might come to the right, you know, stasis level, right? The, the, where, where water meets the, you know, the level. And so, um, it turns out we just have a need for more to be done to grow at the rates we're growing. And yes, I know whenever we talk about these things, you know, someone's going to write, that they're a person of lesser means and they haven't been able to get a job and and not all profits end up and too many profits end up with the CEOs. And I, I, I'm not trying to make all those political statements. You're saying if you go back for a thousand years, higher productivity leads to higher GDP, leads to higher per capita income. It doesn't all happen in a day, but it all leads that way over time, right? And, 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 and so, um, you know, right now, uh, there's no hope of a jobless future in the United States, but there are tasks that are going to go away. If you're in tier one customer support, that's not a job that's long for this world. And that's because AI does that very, very well, very well. It's easy to train. It's easy to bring up. And it's, uh, you know, less than a thousandth the cost of paying humans to do that job. And, and look, there's a task that went away for you as a podcaster which is summarizing your podcast. Yeah. It's gone. And many podcasters, you know, they used to hire an assistant to summarize their podcasts. That assistant is no longer summarizing podcasts. I don't know if they're still there or not, but that task went away, right? So podcasting didn't go away, but that task is no longer of this world. And so there are tasks that are going away. One of the areas that I work on is software QA, and we're automating software quality assurance with AI, so much so that AI is going to find all the buds. And you won't need humans finding bugs with manual testing. You won't need them writing scripts. Now, we're talking about millions of people employed in software QA today that won't need to do that job, won't need to do the job because the job, that job will be gone. There'll be other jobs and there'll be other things they can do in the company, but that task won't be one of them. And I just did a webinar on that the, the, this morning, and it, it's very controversial because many people in that business have been there for 20, 25, 30 years. And they write scripts, they write test scripts, and that test script uh, 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 automates a flow that a user might do. And that's how you test software, right? And they write hundreds and thousands of test scripts and then maintain them. And what I basically said is everything you learn for the last 20, 25 years, 30 years will no longer be valuable within five years and maybe within two years. No one will want you doing that task. It's not a task that's interesting to anyone, right? And they, and they go, you, you know, you're, you're telling me that all of this learning, the 10,000 hours of learning that went into it, and how good I do my job. You don't understand, Kevin. You don't understand how good I am. I do understand how good you are. You're not as good as a machine. I'm sorry. It, it's a freaking machine. And everything we've done with AI, even in the software QA space, blows away what people can do. You know, it'll write scripts about 100,000 times faster than a human. It's yeah. not a marketing term. That's a measured term. It's not an arguable. It's a knowable. And so you get some people who accept that and say, I want to learn the AI and I want to learn to be the robot overlord. And others throw up their hands and go, either I don't believe you or you're lying or it can't work that way or you just don't understand my job. I, I, well, sorry, it's just the machine. It's just the way it works, right? Just like if you're a blog post writer two years ago and your job was to you, people farmed out blog post writing to you and you got $150 a blog post, let's say. Not anymore. Because ChatGPT will write that blog post and will write it in 30 seconds. And it's probably just about as good as what you would have written, in some cases better, depending on the prompts going in. And I can do that for, um, let me think, free. Yeah. Free. That is more than a, a million X improvement in cost. And it's easily you know, a thousand X improvement in speed, I'm probably not going to hire the blog post writer anymore with all due respect. So I think the blog post writer has other skills in life and they should pursue those, but writing blog posts 
probably going to go away, right? As a task, even though there's other things they may write that'll be unique and other insights they may have. But writing that, you know, literally writing it, probably gone. What do you recommend to the people who are going to lose their task oriented jobs in the future? Um, Obviously, this depends on not that age is the determining factor, but people who have been doing the same job for 30 years are probably going to be a little bit less adaptable than somebody who's fresh out of college or, or early in their job career. Right. How, do you, how do people adapt to this future? Adapt, adapt, adapt. I mean, uh, look, you have to upskill. And we've talked about it, upskilling for 25 years in the U.S. And for a long time, it was, we're going we're gonna to teach everyone to code. Probably not. Coding isn't for everybody, right? But 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 here's the good news. Um, the good news is is that unemployment's at an all time low, and there's you know roughly 10 million job openings in the United States today. There's a job for you, but you may have to learn new skills. And you're right. I mean, I think I think we like to say, well, someone who's 55, it's going to be really hard for them to learn new skills. Why is that? Did their brain stop functioning? It isn't any harder than any other age. No, I grant you, you know, when you're at 20, you're 19, you're going to university, you've got open eyes and open mind and open. But learning was hard then, by the way. It wasn't easy, right? I went to Rochester Institute of Technology. Every freaking class was hard. They didn't have a basket weaving class or I would have taken it. Maybe that would have been easy. But everything else was hard. Uh, It was very hard. We tend to forget that it was hard. And high school was hard, you know, for, for, for many of us. So, so everybody's got to get past that. And yes, you might actually really have to do something hard for X months to get a certificate in doing something new, whatever that is. And then you'll be qualified to do that new thing. And look, I, I have known people in their seventies that went back to college and got either their master's or their PhD and they're in their seventies. Yeah. I go, why are you doing that? I just wanted to learn this field. I found it fascinating. Okay. You know, so we can, we can learn throughout life and should learn throughout life. Now, there's a different psychology here that says, does someone who's 50, 55, 60, 65, 70, do they want to learn something new? That's a different problem. But can they learn something new? Most certainly. The human brain is still totally functional. It's working probably different and the memory's a little less and all of, but, but you could totally learn something, something new. And if you couldn't learn something new, then either of the presidential candidates who are running in this particular presidential season, then, you know, they're both around 80 years old, give or take. Then if we thought neither one could ever learn anything new, then neither one should be president. Because every day as the president of the United States, you're going to be confronted with some new problem. And you're going to have to learn about that topic and people are going to have to teach you about it. All I'm making it up. All of a sudden there's a, there's a war in Chile. And you go, Chile, where even is Chile? It's in South America, I think. Where is that? How, how's that work? Who's in charge there? How, what do we have to do? What side are we on? You would have to learn over the course of half a day enough to start to actually opine on what the United States should do. So we must think that an 80-year-old, plus or minus, must be capable of still learning something, still taking in something, meaning that if you're 55 or 60, and you have to start not a new career, but doing some new tasks that you haven't done before that are wanted now, and the old tasks are not wanted. I assure you, you can do that. I encourage you to do it. Please do it because we need you in the workforce and we want you in the workforce and we want people in the workforce to be there as long as they feel that they're producing something. What are the careers that you recommend avoiding? Like, is coding even a viable option at this point? Because are people just going to be able to code via prompting? And I also see people uh, on X going into, uh, I see a lot of copywriters. And I wonder, is that really a good field to be going into at this stage? It's a terrible field to go into. That's what I I thought. I know. I'll go into journalism. Wait, (laughs) (laughs) I want to be a newspaper reporter. Hang on. You know. Uh, there, see, see, we've been eliminating tasks for a long time. This isn't the first time, right? Y- you know, journalism is one that is it has been uh, really under pressure for 25 years since the internet showed up, right? And so, the number of reporters who are employed today at newspapers that can pay them 
I don't know, it was probably 5% of what we had 25 years ago or 10%, some number like that. By the way, I have great reverence for great reporting. But, but, uh, but, you know, the world can afford great reporting from the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and maybe two or three other papers. And that's it. It's all people are going to pay for. And so they have all the great reporters. And yes, there's reporters elsewhere, but there's just not a lot of money floating around. So, you know, I think, I think when you, when you look at some of these tasks, uh, going away and you say, well, what should you do? Coding is one I would not send a lot of people into. We have been short of coders for a long time, but but the truth is in the future, everyone will be a coder because we'll just code in our natural language, English. And, and coding is all about uh, learning languages and learning the logic of a language, the syntax and the logic of a language, Java, Rust, Python, C++, C Sharp, whatever, right? Well, if I don't have to learn Java to code and I can just get the machine to write the Java for me, I'm done. Like everyone's a coder, everyone on earth. There'll be, there'll be 8 billion coders, right? So then actually going to school for coding itself might not be a really good thing. That, that, and I don't know if that's a year from now, but it's certainly over the next three to five years. And the latest code generator called Devon is a large language model uh, that was trained just on coding tasks. And it outperforms chat GPT, obviously, outperforms everything and outperforms Copilot. It is amazingly good. Like I can get it to write just about anything as long as I can describe it. Now, what I, the other thing I would say about coding is there are insides of systems. So I'm not trying to like design a game insides of systems that are so hard to describe in English. I really need to write it in code because English wasn't uh, designed to be a descriptive language for logical code flow. So there are, there will be a need for some coders, but it may not be at the, at the rate of hiring that we had in the past. Okay. So what, the follow-on question to this is, what should people go into? But you have to ask that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's the next question. Obviously, That's the next yeah, question. what should people go into? Where should people direct their energy? So you're going to laugh, but then it'll make sense. Most trades, plumber, HVAC repair person, uh, electri- electrician, etc. Let me tell you why. So AI can certainly code today and it's getting better and better. And eventually it's going to be ridiculously good in a matter of a year or two and certainly write content, but AI to come into your home and repair a plumbing problem. First of all, would have to be a humanoid robot because our homes are built for humanoids. So we are building humanoid robots. They're getting really good. And in the next 10 years, we will probably all have a humanoid robot in our home. But the repairing of plumbing is very complicated because every home is different. Every home is different. The problem is different and the plumbing is different. It was just put in for that home. It was sort of custom. And so you don't know where the problem is and how to get to it and how to undo which pipe and what, and what's going to happen, how much water is going to come out and where, you know, where the clog is or whatever. And so it's so complicated that to design a plumbing robot that would go to every home and be, be able to diagnose and do something would cost so much money as to be not viable. It's just a not, not viable. Same with HVAC repair. I mean, every heater is different and every problem is different. It's like, it's just, it's not happening in the next decade or two or three. So, um, and, and, and people are leaving those fields. They're retiring from the fields way faster than anyone coming in. So today in Silicon Valley, we pay, uh, far more for a plumber to come to the house than we pay per hour for a coder. And in Silicon Valley, you know, coders can make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, not all of them, but, you know, starting at a hundred and something and going to 200 and something and 300 and something. And that's crazy. It's like, okay, well, I will tell you, plumbers right now are charging, you know, $500 to show up at your house, fix the thing. And they were there for 20 minutes. Now they spent time getting there, spent time getting out, Anyway, you can go through those numbers and these people aren't working 40 hours a work week. They're working 50 or 60. And so that plumber that I just described is probably making $600,000 a year Hmm. as a plumber. That's, that's not as much as a podcaster makes, but it's pretty good. (laughs) I wish I were the case. Uh, Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, now it's true. If you have a billion people listen to your podcast, you would make that kind of money and then sell. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've told people for a long time that trades is a great way to go. Um, college is great and all. I think learning is a lifelong process anyway, but trades are very valuable and they're not going to go out of flavor anytime soon. That's right. That That's exactly right. And so for now, the trades are one of the safest areas you can go in. The demand is ridiculous. The money you can make is ridiculous. Everything is good about it. Like there's nothing bad. Uh, about going into that space and uh, and crushing it. And so I highly recommend that. And people just laugh at first and then they go, you're right. And by the way, every conference I, I, I do, you know, 40, 50 keynotes a year, a lot of them are to trades. And, you know, I, I, I spoke to the uh, Restaurant Equipment Repair Association. They are dying. They cannot get enough people to work. And, and when they do hire someone, they have no mechanical skills because they grew up playing video games, not repairing cars. And so when they say, look, here, you're going to take this thing apart and here's the motor and here's the solenoid and here's the thermostat. And here they look at them and go, I don't even know what you're talking about. What are those things? They don't know the difference between a motor and an engine. There's a very big difference, right? Mm. And so, and so you, even if you can get a body to show up, they're starting with zero knowledge of any kind of equipment whatsoever. Because they played video games, they didn't take apart cars and repair things. And so we have just a fundamental issue here. And um, again, go go where there's low supply and high demand. Plumbers, electricians, right? Uh, equipment repair, HVAC repair. You know, huge demand, no supply of people. With With jobs changing a lot by 2050, are we heading for a future where those that have capital at one instant, it, it kind of freezes where everyone is basically stuck in the class or position that they're currently in at that point in time? Um, look, I, I, you know, I, I'll, I'll opine a bit. So, so clearly, you know, the movement between classes, if you will, or between levels or stratifications of economy within a single generation is typically one move, maybe two, but, but a case, you know, occasionally people go from the very bottom rung to whatever, however you want to lay those rungs out. Like in the United States, maybe there's nine classifications and rarely does someone jump from level zero to level nine. It happens, but it's rare. Normally you go from zero to one or one to two within a generation, right? And then you hope your kids are one step, step better, for example, right? We have, that's what we hope for. I, uh, people do get trapped in their stratifications anyway. They get trapped in that class uh, layer because that's what they grew up with and that's what they knew and that's what their parents did. And so that's probably the norm anyway. I don't know that AI is going to have a big impact because what I can say is those who embrace new technology tend to move up in those stratifications and those that don't embrace new technology tend to move down. And that started with the wheel. You know, when the wheel came to town, the two guys carrying food up the hill, one of them said, my life is over. And the other one said, I'm going to get a second wheel, make a cart and, and carry everybody's food up. And we don't need the first guy. Right. So you want to be the guy who embraces the technology, even if it's the freaking wheel, as opposed to the guy in that case who said the, the wheel is the end of my life. Right. So people who embrace new technology tend to move up, tend to move up in their companies. And I'll give you another example. In the late 80s, Excel is out, and some people would show up for a job interview in finance and say, well, I, yeah, I haven't used Excel, but I was, I was trained uh, using a pencil, and I've really got ledger books down. They didn't get hired because by the late 80s, if you didn't know Excel, you were not going to be in finance. That was it. So I propose to you that even by this fall, if you're coming out of a university and you show up for a job interview and you don't use Copilot for coding, let's say in a coding interview or in a marketing interview, I, I've never used uh, uh, any uh, uh, generative AI to generate anything, any marketing content, so I don't know how to use it. You're not going to get hired. The people who are going to get hired are the kids coming out of college that say, or any age that say, I'm an expert in this tool. 
Here's what I've done. Boom, 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 boom. Here's my portfolio of output. You go, hired, right? So those who embrace the technology are the only ones who are going to get hired. And if you didn't embrace the technology, there won't even be an opportunity for you. There will be no opportunity. And um, I can't emphasize that enough. So look, even if, if you're 30 or 40 or 50 or 60, 70, I would want to learn this stuff cold so that whatever I do next, I'm coming in with that knowledge, with that experience. And that's valuable because that is going to be valuable, right? I'm an expert. You know, if, if you're a prompting expert on um, chat GPT today, I think everyone, every company wants that. You're, you're going to get high. Hi, I've never used the large language model in my life. Uh, let me look. Nope, have no jobs here for you. Get out. I got enough people who haven't used it. I don't need anyone else, right? So that's my advice. So what is your advice for people that want to... A lot of people are using AI, but not a lot of people are making money using AI. How do people transition from just an AI user to somebody who is monetizing their use of AI or, or making themselves valuable? Well, I'd say this, right? If you're within a company, what you're doing is you're improving your productivity with the use of AI, right? And and it's not about making money, it's that you've improved your productivity. So everybody should be improving the productivity with AI today. So no matter what you do, you know, I improve my productivity in my keynote speeches by the use of AI, period, full stop. So I spend a little less time, maybe quite a bit less time, actually creating the content that's customized for each of my customers. But I can spend less time creating the content and more time strategizing about what it is I want to create, right? This is good. This is really, really good. So am I making money from it? I, well, I guess sort of. You know, my presentations are better. They're crisper. The illustrations are better. So the writing is better, right? Um, I'm still in control of it. It came from my mind. But, you know, some of the tedium of tasks got relegated to AI. And, uh, and so, yes, I, I, you know, I think, yes. Now, if you're an illustrator and nobody's coming to you to illustrate anymore, what I would say is you really want to be the master of these tools so that you're still in the illustration business, but now you're in the business of utilizing the tools along with your knowledge set. Right. And, and now maybe you don't do that for a thousand dollars. Maybe it's $300, but you can take on 10 times more clients. Are there any specific tools that you recommend people get into that? a lot of people haven't familiarized themselves with, like everyone knows about chat GPT by now. Most people know about mid journey. Are there any, and you talked about Vanna earlier. Are there any other ones that you, yeah, you I mean, hi, hyper right is good because it, it, it is embedded certain props for you. So it's already got, you know, I don't know, over a hundred kind of subjects that, and it says, I would like to write a blog post. I need to write a business plan. I need, and so they pre set up sort of templates embedding, um, behind the model for you to do that. And that just saves you from having to learn how to do that. Right. So if there's already a template there and it says, I need to write a business plan, boom, you know, I want to go to the business plan version of this. Right. And so HyperWrite has done that. I think that's really a cool tool for that for most people that don't want to get in the nitty gritty of sort of everything else. Um, Dolly three is a great image generator today, but you know, Stable Diffusion and, and Mid Journey also, but I think Dolly 3 is, is, um, right up there, you know, sort of at the top. But those, those, those are the, those are the best tools. There's lots of other stuff coming along from, from, from startups that is, uh, is leveraging the foundational models to do some, some new things, but most of them are very specific areas. So maybe I want to do sales training and, and there'll be a sales training model, for instance, right? So I'm, I don't want ChatGPT to do that. It's too much work I'm going to have to do, but they've already set it up as a template. But HyperWrite's a good place to start because you got like 100 templates and you can do something five minutes from now that's going to be super interesting. Awesome. Uh, one of the last things I wanted to ask you about was, I wanted to backtrack just a little bit. I forgot to ask about this when it popped in, into my mind. Um, a friend and I were talking a few weeks ago maybe a few months ago, and we were touching on that reality, not being able to discern reality. And he hypothesized that 
we might end up in a future where people reject online interaction altogether and they start opting for in-person brick and mortar mm-hmm. stores like that. Because if you can, if you can fake every piece of the interaction, you, you even go to a reputable site like Amazon and right. you're not really even on Amazon, then you just stop trusting everything that's online. Do you see that as a possibility? Well, I mean, we could already fake Amazon to some extent, well, to a great extent. So I, I, I think uh, I think a fake URL is probably nothing new and not the issue. But the issue of interpersonal communication uh, that's trustworthy is an interesting one because because we got some experience with that now. We did Zoom, certainly, uh, and, and it's like uh, during COVID because that's all there was. And then... So, so to speak, post COVID, we saw sort of two behaviors emerge. One was, I want to keep doing Zoom. This, I actually like this and I don't really want to interact with real people other than Zoom. And others just ran out there and said, I'm free and I want to be with people live and I can't wait to be with people live and I want to go celebrate and I, I want to go have dinner and, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. And, um, look, humans are in general naturally social animals. Not everyone, but the vast majority are social animals. And I think if you're a social animal, you want to get out there with real people. And um, and AI might make that a more unique situation now because we're going to be so busy, you know, with AI and ultimately our AI agent that sort of knows us that we will really relish times with actual humans. Already there have been deep fakes on Zoom that convince people to send money where they shouldn't and all of that, that it's actually quite easy to do. So, so, so people might get to a point where they don't fully believe who they're seeing and they will believe them if they see them live, because today we're not building robots with, you know, human like skin. No. Um, we have built some, we've seen them, they can operate, but it's very expensive to do and doesn't seem to uh, provide a lot of benefit over, you know, a robot just looks like a robot. So my suspicion is it probably won't make human humanoid that looks that fakes us out that it's human. And then you don't know, right? But but there'll be a time I'm doing a podcast that I will not be able to tell whether literally Artie is here or Artie's sick in bed and you've got uh fake Artie literally doing the interview. Because that's a possibility. And that's almost possible now. It yeah. is possible technically now. It's kind of cool. So do I have real Artie today or artificial Definitely have Artie? real Artie. <laughs> okay. How I do eventually I want to do it in person too. Because yeah, yeah. there's something that you miss when with a, a remote interview, even though I, I love the technology. I But there is something you don't quite get. In no no remote- question. Oh, when I do on stage interviews, you know, it's so different than... I'm interviewing someone over Zoom or something, which I think is difficult, especially in a room with people, right? Uh, on yeah. stage and two people really interacting is a game changer. I love to ask people about books because I'm a huge reader myself. And for anyone else that likes to read, I love to have, you know, recommendations for them based on the expertise of our guests. Um, do you have any books that you recommend that could be related to technology or anything that has influenced you in your life? Yeah, what I what I have recently read is Impromptu Amplifying Our Humanity Through AI. I, had a, I wanted to get the title right, so I did by, by Reed Hoffman. Um, he uses ChatGPT 100% throughout the book to basically help write the book and prove his point that these are the things you can do with this. And I just think that's a great way to get comfortable with this technology and amp and comfortable with the fact that we're amplifying our brain. We're amplifying our brain by using these technologies. We're not giving up our brain. We're not, we're amplifying our brain. And this is really pretty fascinating, right? Um, so I think that's a great book. It's a great entry uh, entree to, to using chat GPT in ways that you would have never thought of ever. And, uh, and it's an easy read and most of it was written by chat GPT. So hmm. I, I think that's super fascinating. Awesome. Uh, any other books or anything? That's it for today. Okay. Um, you know, I am reading Burn uh, by um, that, that. That's terrible. I just I just saw her speak. It's funny. I, I just dropped the name. I should have thought about it. Yeah. By Kara Swisher. So Kara Swisher used to be the tech reporter for 
the Wall Street Journal, and 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 I've known Kara. Kara's great. The Burn book is great because basically kind of burns a bunch of guys in Silicon Valley that um, maybe don't always behave well. Hmm. And uh, and um, so you know she's just here's the things I've learned in my career, and here's how I interviewed these people, and this is what really happened behind the scenes, and you know the, here's all the bad things, right? So she's sort of burning the people. Which, if you're, you know, if if you like hearing stories about Silicon Valley, it's a it's it's a great book about that, about uh, including Elon Musk and sort of everyone you've ever heard, you know, mentioned. She's interviewed and she has her opinion. Awesome. Well, Kevin, it's been awesome talking to you today. I really appreciate your time. Uh, before we wrap up, can you give the listeners a way to find you if they want to yeah. book you as a speaker? Anything else you want to share? Yeah, be- best way to find me, book me as a speaker, whatever, is just my website, kevinserace.com, K-E-V-I-N-S-U-R-A-C-E.com. And you'll probably put it in the chat notes or whatever, but uh, um, super easy to find me there. And there's a LinkedIn thing. and. Uh, I'll answer my LinkedIn messages and um, and then there's a bunch of booking agencies and all the typical stuff. Awesome. Kevin, thank you so much for your time today. It's been really good talking to you. Thank you much. It was a pleasure to be on the show. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Thoughtfully Mindless. If you're enjoying the podcast, please leave a five-star review on Spotify and Apple. It goes a long way in helping the podcast grow and reach more listeners. You can also like and subscribe on YouTube. And if you want to support the show, you can go to FractalZoo.net, where I have unique Fractal-inspired clothing. Each purchase goes directly toward helping the podcast grow. I'll also leave my Amazon affiliate link in the description. You can click on that before making an Amazon purchase, and a small commission may go to the podcast. I love to connect with my audience, so find me on Twitter or X at Artie TM Podcast. That's A R T I E T M Podcast. Or you can find me on Instagram at Thoughtfully Mindless. Thank you for listening today. That's it for this one. Until next time, stay thoughtfully mindless. <laughs>